And thank you again for joining us for this edition of the 2014 Campaign Roundtable Series. I'm politics reporter Rob Rizzuto, and we are here with two Republican candidates running to represent the 2nd Franklin District and the Massachusetts House. Again, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. Um, we are going to talk about the topic of uh, business and luring business to the district. Um, so if a business leader or CEO came to you and said, I am looking at potentially locating this new facility in your district, but I'm also looking at, say, something next door, somewhere out of the, uh, the towns that you represent. What would you say to help sell them on the Second Franklin District as a great place to do business and grow their industry? Um, and Ms. Anderson, let me start with you. Okay. <laughs> we actually have some of that already. When talking with different people, there's some good suggestions that have been coming um, just out there when I'm out door to door talking with the people. One of them is that we have a lot of junk timber in our forest areas. New England was cleared out maybe a hundred years ago there were hardly any trees and since then we have a lot of lands that were family owned maybe 30 acres or more and divided up into smaller acres of five and ten and people have put things into conservation and the problem is that this young timber it's been about 20 years old now or more depends on different places it's called junk timber it's not good for harvesting to make furniture with and it needs to be cleared out or we're going to end up in a situation like California where we have forest fires and that is um, becoming a thing that foresters are concerned about I'm working with a couple of foresters that are going through and the suggestion has been made that we could have manufacturing in our area using that junk timber and making wood pellets wood pellet demand is up high now because people are trying to get away from fossil fuels mm -hmm. and so this would be one way if we put this manufacturing in our area it would be there's a need for it there's a place to manufacture it and we just need to get this assembled the problem that we're finding is that a lot of our laws legislative laws are causing the issues we have so many taxes and fees that people are getting taxed and fees out of business and we need to change some of those things so that we can be a self-sufficient state the Commonwealth of Massachusetts so that we can sustain ourselves sustainability with that and if we could harvest amongst those private lands we could use those and people could sell off that um, junk timber off in their property mm -hmm. paying those taxes increasing the growth and that could be one of the ways that we could be self-sustaining it would be awesome if we could get this manufacturing going yeah, so you're looking at the land looking at the opportunity absolutely that the provides absolutely and to sell that and also yes. attacking uh, perhaps you know the, the issue of taxes relating to business absolutely and the that Massachusetts is anti-business because of the taxes correct correct okay. we've had so many businesses leave the state already um, we're called tax Massachusetts unfortunately it's not because our sales tax is higher than New York because New York is higher but it's because of the multiplicity of our taxes mm -hmm. even if you look at your phone bill I'm sure there's five or more taxes on there one of them is an advertising tax for their name on your bill so we have to if we could curb those taxes it would bring in more business mm -hmm. It's kind of the story, if you put out one Coke machine or if you could put out multiple Coke machines, how much money would you make more? If we would lower our taxes, mm -hmm. the business would come in more. And I'm not just talking about the sales tax, I'm talking about the multiplicity of taxes and the multiplicity of fees that we have. Mm -hmm. And that's what's basically smothering Massachusetts, because people cannot afford to have their businesses with those. Sure. And Susanna? Yes, as a business owner who in the last six years has gone from 28 employees up to 68 or 69 this week, um, I completely understand the taxes, the burdens, and the regulations that are placed on a business in Massachusetts. We're, ju we're usually listed as number three on the list of the most, the least business friendly in, in the country. Thank God New York and California, I guess, because it keeps us from being on the bottom. I have firsthand experience with the, the legislation and the taxes that businesses face. On a quarterly basis, I'm outreached by Virginia and North Carolina's um, economic development um, committees of their state offering to fly me to <laughs> Virginia mm -hmm. or North Carolina or whatever to look at manufacturing facilities and look at acreage and possibly move my company south. Mm -hmm. I have such a commitment to my town. I've been in my community for 45 years. My father started my company back in 1977. We're committed to the town. We're mm -hmm. not going anywhere. What we need to do is we need to look at some of those punitive taxes that are placed on business. And for example, the inventory tax. 
I don't know if many people realize in Massachusetts, if you own a business, you pay an inventory tax. It's kind of like you have a house and you pay property tax. Then the government comes in and taxes all your furniture and everything you have the in it. Um, somebody who buys tens of thousands of tons of steel on a regular basis, that really puts a good whopping on you. You know, I mean, it's it's been difficult to succeed in Massachusetts, but it can be done. Um, we, as as employers, we're so grateful to our employees, and they come and work for us, and they stay a decade, two decades. I've got employees that have been with me for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And being part of the community and being an active part of the community, I would welcome new business. I'd explain to them some of the techniques we've used to be successful, some of the ways around, but certainly as a legislator, I would know what some of the things that stifle me and prevent me from growing. Frankly, if you look at our company before we hit the 50 person threshold, mm -hmm. We actually were more profitable and did better with 50 employees than we do now with 68, um, just from a, a financial standpoint. Mm -hmm. and, you know, our shareholders are all local people who understand it's important for us to stay where we are. But I can see where businesses would look at Massachusetts as a whole and say, geez, I think I could do better elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, one thing businesses do look at, um, Market Basket, which they're having their inner struggles right now. Definitely. But Market Basket, is in the process of a new grocery store in the town of Athol. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons they're coming to our town was the investment we've put into our community with a new library, with a new police station, new senior center. And since I've been on the Board of Selectmen, our property tax rate has gone up over 50% over the course of eight years. And that's due to cuts to municipal aid and other issues, which I hope we get to further on. <laughs> But for businesses to look at the people in a community or the people in a district and see what they're doing to keep going and see the kind of stock, because we've got good skilled labor working in, that are working in our town and eager to work. And I think the most important thing to do is to introduce businesses to our people, because our, our towns are all built of people who came as immigrant groups coming to the mm -hmm. towns to work for the tool manufacturers or the chair manufacturers and gardener. You know, I mean, it's getting people to know businesses to know the people. Mm -hmm. I think would certainly sell them for our district, and I don't think we've done enough marketing of the area for businesses. So you can see building those relationships and Absolutely. selling the opportunities that are already there, as well as attacking the uh, tax structure on the business side as ways to draw business. Absolutely. All right, very good. Well, thank you. Uh, well, we will switch gears a little bit. Um, the next question um, is actually relating to medical marijuana. Um, in 2012, the Massachusetts voters approved medical marijuana by way of a ballot question um, that November. Um, basically, the law calls for the licensing of dozens of dispensaries across the Commonwealth. Um, and it also removed the criminal penalties for growing marijuana and possession as long as folks have a valid prescription from a medical care professional. Um, so basically the question for you is, do you support uh, the use of marijuana medically and would you be supportive of dispensaries working to open up in the 2nd Franklin District? And uh, Susanna, we can start with you um, on this. Well, as a legislator, I will have to look at all sides of an issue and I, I have looked very closely at this. As a daughter of a mom who's 80 years old and takes chemotherapy pill every day, um, if THC, which is the active ingredient in marijuana, um, tetrahydrocannabinol, I think mm -hmm. is what it's called, would be helpful to her and bring her some comfort, I, that would be a decision between her and her doctor. Mm -hmm. There's also Marinol, which is a synthetic version of THC, which right. uh, having a husband in the pharmaceutical industry of I've <laughs> done a little research and we've discussed that as well. As far as the dispensaries go, I don't know why anybody would go to a particular pharmacy for one drug and have to go to a CVS or another pharmacy for another drug. Um, the dispensaries, the way it's been set up, I don't see the state having a very good plan with regards to the implementation of it. Also, we're seeing it passed a vote, but nobody really wants it in their community. Mm -hmm. As a business owner, I, I have to look at medical marijuana and the American with Disabilities Act and accommodations you have to make for employees who are under medication or under a doctor's care. Um, thankfully, the American with Disability Act considers a federal law of marijuana being illegal, so I wouldn't have to 
worry about accommodations and changes to an employee um, who was taking medical marijuana. But if you think about cranes going overhead and forklifts going, the well-being and the safety of the, for the men and women who work with me is paramount. So I really, I, I'm torn on the issue mm -hmm. of medical marijuana as it stands right now. Um, again, comfort for my mom who stays home and isn't driving a forklift and operating mm -hmm. an overhead crane that might have a ton of metal on it. And the guys in my factory who may, you know, be in danger if one of our coworkers was, was using medical marijuana. So there's a lot of research to be done. I'm not an expert, but of course as a legislator I would look at all sides of the issue and try to make the most reasonable and safe decision for all of the people. Gotcha. So you look at uh, the use of medical marijuana as you support that, but you have concerns about the, w the law itself and the way it's exactly. being implemented. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Anderson. Absolutely. The same issues as the concerns. Um, when you look in Colorado and some of the other places and the problems that they're having from having the distribution all over the place, um, if it is a medical condition, a medical prescription, then it should be offered with your other prescriptions. It should be able to be attained at the same place. Um, and again, as she's mentioned, as if you are not allowed to drive a car because you're under um, medical condition that it says don't drive, your doctor says don't do that, um, I think that marijuana should fall under that too, that if they shouldn't be allowed to work at that workplace that would put someone in danger if they have those certain medicines. And so uh, I'm in agreement, we shouldn't have it in our area that the law should be revised if the federal law says no and right now that's what the federal law is that we should abide by that and even if we want to make these other changes I think they better, better be more examined before they implement them. So, so I guess just generally speaking about uh, marijuana as a potential medical option you're opposed to that? It's an option if it's prescribed as a medicine, that's one thing. If you can mm -hmm. have it from a pharmacy, if you're gonna grow it in your own backyard, there's nobody monitoring who's growing it, there's nobody monitoring how much you take from your own backyard. Exactly, exactly. If you're gonna have a medicine, a medicine's a medicine. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to use it as a recreational um, thing, there's something altogether. And who's gonna make those definitions? I think they better be very careful with that. So as a medicine, yes, I am in support of it, having it as a medicine, but not as somebody growing it in their own backyard or not as having a dispensary separate from every other medicine that's prescribed. Treating it more like a controlled substance and the distribution Absolutely. network mirroring that of other controlled substances, Correct. which is through a specific pharmacy, not a dispensary specifically for this right. plan. Okay. Right. Understood. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, and. We are looking at uh, this race here. We have um, State Rep Denise Andrews, who's a Democrat. She has um, successfully ran two terms in the second Franklin District, and now she's running for a third. Um, so to both you candidates, I would just like you to explain to the voters, you know, what about you and your ideas and your dedication to the job makes you a better choice for them um, first come the primary in September and then the general election in November. And uh, Susanna, we can start with you on this. Sure. Um, well, Ms. Andrews' voting record speaks for itself. She's never met a tax she didn't like. Our municipal aid has been cut tremendously. I want to go to Beacon Hill to bring back municipal aid, to bring opportunities to people in our district. When I ran against Ms. Andrews in 2012, there was a third party candidate in the race, also factoring in President Obama and Senator Warren bringing people to the polls. I'm very confident about the general election this time around. I'm a proven job creator. I've got a history of public service and charitability in my community. And honestly, I believe I'm the only candidate out of the two of us that has a really good chance of beating the incumbent and bringing back some change. Uh, the, having a super majority of Democrats on Beacon Hill has been disastrous for us. Decades of one party rule has basically created an air of arrogance where these folks don't believe that cuts to municipal aid hurt families and hurt children and hurt our seniors. We send money to Boston via the lottery and via income tax, which never really makes its way back to us. We get 30, 33 cents on the dollar back for what we pay in income tax. 
Lawrence, Lowell, Springfield, bigger cities, blue voting cities tend to get in the 80s, 90s mm -hmm. cents per dollar back. Um, I'm going to speak out for people. I'm going to demand transparency. I'm going to demand that the second Franklin district get some of the attention. One of the issues that is most hard hitting to most people who have been there a lifetime is the Quadman Reservoir. Eighty years ago, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts came out and decided they needed a water source for the folks in Boston. So four towns are disincorporated and emptied out for the common good, well, for the Commonwealth, water that we don't even drink. And actually, the day I get sworn in, I'm expecting to pour a glass of water from Boston because I've always wondered what the Quabbin tastes like. <laughs> I look at it all the time, but I've never tasted it. But I'm, I'm feeling good about this race. I'm very confident, and I know I'm the candidate who can beat Ms. Andrews. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ms. Anderson. As a mother of six and a caretaker of seniors, um, I could be sending the people my resume in the mail and all the things that I could do, but it's not about me. It's about representing the people. And being out there with my little girl who's three and talking to the young mothers, I'm hearing what their needs are. Being out there with those that are in grade school, parents of those in the high school levels, parents of those who have college age children, I have all of that. Taking care of my grandmother for Till she's 94 in heaven now but for the last nine years my other grandmother's 89 I still continue to take care of her I understand the needs of those seniors because I'm doing it every day every day I'm taking care of them also it's not about me that way I'm also working with cerebral palsy and working with them I hire people I know about business I've hired two people in the last six months and that doesn't sound like a lot but as a surrogate I don't have to but I have to make sure that their time sheets are correct. I have to make sure that their hours are worked. I have to make sure that the stock is ordered. I understand about business. And like other people in our area, they have to pick up small businesses such as Tupperware, uh, Sensi, um, Pampered Chef. And I've worked in those businesses too. And those things teach you that you are your own boss. If you don't work, you don't get paid. I understand those needs. We've done this. As a mother of six, this is what our area has to have, is the thing in common, that we would have someone represent us, not themselves, when they get there. And that's why I've been chosen, and I have so many people that have been coming up to me from all the parties, the Democrats, the unenrolled, and the Republican, who are excited to have a voice. And I've asked them repeatedly, you know, send to me what you want represented, because it's not about me sending you my resume. It's about hearing your voice, what is important to you. That what's what needs to be represented on Beacon Hill. And we're going to do that. And I thank you for this opportunity to share. Oh, Karen Anderson, Susanna Whipsley. Thank you. Thank you ladies both very much for joining us today and discussing the issues. Um, I'd like to thank our journalist panel, Ron Shamelis and Rob Janess. Thank you gentlemen very much. And we'd like to thank the readers and the viewers. Um, we do this all for you. We like to get the information out there and bring the candidates directly to you. Um, this is a very important election year. There's a lot of candidates running for a lot of different offices. And more important than who you vote for is the fact that you get out and vote. So the primary is on September 9th, and the general election is on November 4th. Make time those days and get out into the polls and vote. And thank you very much for watching. And ladies, thank again, you. thank yeah. you very much for joining us. Thank you. That's terrific. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. This forum and others like it throughout the election season will be available online at cbs3springfield.com, masslive.com, and full coverage in the Republican newspaper and on New England Public Radio. Thanks for watching.